Now in Numbers chapter 20 here, we've got this story. And we turned to this story last week, but I'm going to cover a different aspect of it. And basically what we're preaching out today, keep your finger in Numbers chapter 20. We're going to flip back to Exodus 17 because we're going to see a very, very similar story to what happens here in Numbers 20. We're going right back to Numbers 20, but flip back to Exodus 17. And basically we see here the story of this, it's called the waters of Meribah, right? And, in, and basically what happens in Numbers chapter 20 here is... You know, the children of Israel walking around the wilderness, they get to this place, they come out of the wilderness of Zin, and they get to this place, and they don't have any water. So the people start murmuring, they start complaining again, why have you brought us out of Egypt? You know, why have you brought us to this land? There's nothing here, there's no water for us, there's no, you know, it's not a good land, all this other stuff, and they start complaining to him. So God tells Moses and Aaron, he said, okay, take your rod, and go and speak unto the waters, and they'll bring forth they'll bring forth waters abundantly. And so what he does, he goes and it says he hits the rock twice, and the water comes out, and they you know and the waters for the beasts and for the people, the children of Israel. And God gets really mad with with Moses and Aaron. He says, because of this, you're not going to go into the promised land. He said, because you believe me not. And we're going to get into this a little bit later. But this is basically what happens here in Numbers chapter 20. Now in Exodus 17, we see a very similar story. Look at verse number 4 of Exodus 17. The Bible says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. So again, this is a story. The children of Israel are getting upset. They're saying, you know, there's no water. Why have you brought us out into this wilderness? Right? I mean, it's the same, the same type of event playing out here. And, and Moses goes to God and he says, look, they're ready to kill me. Verse number five. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And I should have had this in my notes, but I don't. I'm going to look at it real quick because it also refers to this event. This is really important for a point for the sermon. It refers to this also as the water of Meribah because the people chode with the, with the Lord. And um, I gotta have this in my notes. Verse seven. Is it verse seven? It says and he called the name of the place. Thank you. I just I must have read past that when I was looking at it. Thank you. Yeah, verse verse number seven of chapter seventeen. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, "Is the Lord among us or not?" Now. What I want to point out here is that story in Numbers chapter 20. What happened was, again, God told Moses, he says, Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. His commandment to Moses there was to, was to speak unto a rock, right? He didn't say anything about hitting it with the rock. And it shall bring forth his water. But here in Exodus 17, we see, he says, Behold, I will stand before the, the there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. So in Exodus 17, God's telling Moses, hey, hit it with your rod and the water will come out. And it says that's exactly what he did, right? Both places, it refers to those places being called the waters of Meribah. So at first glance, you think, well, wait a minute. How, how is that possible, right? How, how can that be that, that two different events happened, yet it's the same, seemingly the same place, right? The waters of Meribah. Well, the first thing you have to understand is that these are actually, and this is, this is the whole key basically, is that these are two different events. And I can prove, I'm, and we're going to prove that to you from the Bible. These are two separate places. Now, first of all, the name being called like Waters of Meribah, there are multiple places, geographical regions in the Bible that contain the same name. Where, they, where a name has been used more than once, it's not always just defining one specific geographic location. I mean, you, more, normally it is. For the most part it is, but but it's it's definitely possible to have different areas or different waters with the same name, right? And 
basically the same thing happened, so that made sense because it says, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the children of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? That is the reason why he gave it that name. And basically the same events happen in both stories. So giving it the same name makes sense because they're both saying, you know, why have you brought us up out of Egypt? Oh, there's no water to drink. And there's murmuring and complaining and just being faithless against God. So in both places, he has to bring water out of, this, out of, out of these rocks. And when I, I remember looking at this, I studied this, I said, you know what? I start off from the point, I know God's word is true. I know that there's no mistakes I know that there's no translation errors in the King James Bible. I know that there's no, you know, God's word is pure. But when you look at this, you start thinking like, well, wait a minute. What, why, why does it say that here? Because it looks like the same event. But um, flip back, if you would, to Numbers. We're going to go actually to Numbers chapter 33. Because this is how we could know absolutely for a certainty. Now, I already, even before, before finding this in Numbers 33, I already kind of decided in my mind, just looking at the two, the two chapters and kind of comparing them, even though they said it's the same, you know, the waters of Meribah, I already kind of figured, well, this must have been two different events that happened. It, has, it, it just has to be because you're not going to have two, you know, when one Moses smiting the rock and the other one him not, and then God getting angry with, with Moses and saying, you're not allowed in the promised land because you did this, Right? I mean, that, that just wouldn't make any sense at all. But Numbers chapter 33, here we have in Numbers 33, this is one of those seemingly boring chapters. Okay, you know what I'm talking about when you're reading the Bible. You know, there's, there's, there's multiple chapters that they'll go through and they'll just list genealogies. And all you're doing is listing names, right? And you're reading, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and so-and-so. -and -so, you know, and you just go down this list. You're thinking, why is this in the Bible, God? Why is this here? This is so hard to get through. It's so hard to read. Numbers 33, it gives us basically the path, all the different places that the children of Israel went through while they were in the wilderness. So look at verse number 1 of Numbers 33. It says, These are the journeys of the children of Israel which went forth out of the land of Egypt and their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. So he's saying, he basically recorded, we went here, we went here, we went here, you know, and it's all the different places that they were going to. I mean, they were, whether they were going in circles or everywhere they were going in the region, Numbers 33 records all these different events. Jump down to verse number 14, because here's where we get the absolute definite proof why Exodus 17 and Numbers 20 are talking about two different events. Numbers 33 verse 14 says, And they removed from Alish and encamped at Rephidim. Okay, remember that word Rephidim. Where was no water for the people to drink. And they departed from Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, this is the event that happens in Exodus 17. And I should have had you kept, keep a finger there, but in Exodus 17 verse 1, it says... And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandments of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Right? So if you're looking at verse 14 of Numbers 33, it says, And camped at Rephidim, where was no water for the people to drink. Exodus 17, 1, they pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Exodus 17 goes, okay, this is where we're at in this story. It lines up perfectly. It lines up exactly, okay, that's exactly where we're at in their, in their journeys. Well, now look at Numbers 33. Jump down to verse number 36. You got all this, all these other journeyings going on. Verse 36 says, And they were moved from Ezion Geber and pitched in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh. And they were moved from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. And Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. This is where the events took place from Numbers 20. This all makes sense. Because if you remember, we read Numbers 20 before the, before the sermon started. And there we saw in that story, that's when the children of Israel wanted to pass by Edom. And Edom came out and said, no. They came out with a strong hand and said, you are not walking through. They're like, please, you know, like, we're not going to, we'll, we'll give you money for the water that we drink. You know, we just want to go by the highway. We don't want, you know, we don't want any trouble. We're just going to pass on through your land. 
anything that we eat or drink, we're going to pay you for it. And they came out and said, no, you can't do that. And um, we also saw in Numbers 20, that's also where Aaron died. Aaron got himself up in the mount, and that's where they died. They stripped his clothes off of him and put him on his, on his son. And um, in Numbers 33 here, it says that they were at the edge of the land of Edom in verse 37. And then in verse 38, and Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor, the commandment of the Lord, and died there. So you can see these events are taking place. This is exactly where they are. And actually, they're, they're quite a bit of time apart out because they did all these other journeyings in between those two times. And, um, of course, Numbers 20, verse 1 says, Then came the children of Israel, the whole congregation, in the, de the desert of Zin, which matches up with Numbers 33, 36. They pitched in the wilderness of Zin. And then it says, um, And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there, which, again, follows verse 36, which is Kadesh. And then um, in verse 14 in Numbers 20, that's where and Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Right? All of that to say this, right? This is, there's a whole reason why I'm proving this to you. Okay? I could have just said, these are just two different events. Right? The two, the, 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 there's no contradiction here because they're just two different events and just keep moving on with the sermon. It's extremely important that we exercise and go through this stuff in the Bible because this is how you ought to be studying the Bible. This is the, this is the type of attention and details you ought to have. This is something that when you see something and, and, you, and you look at the Bible and say, wait a minute, that just doesn't look right. Because that's exactly what I did when I was reading this. I was hearing these stories and I'd heard a, a, a sermon preached one time in a preaching class about, about um, this event in Numbers 20. And... I was thinking, oh yeah, hey, this is a great sermon, this is cool, you know, I was, I was learning from it. And then later on in my personal reading, I saw the, the story in Exodus 17, I wait a minute, I'm scratching my head. I know in Numbers 20, God told him to speak under the rock, and this is the sermon I, I heard preached on, but then in Exodus 17, it says, he said, he's telling him to hit the rock. And in both places, it's, you know, it's calling it, it's, you know, it's seemingly the same place. It looks like it's the same story. The children of Israel are getting upset, they're mad, you know, and without really knowing the Bible and just just knowing it really good, like the back of your hand, it's easy to, to kind of get confused with this stuff. That's why it requires more study and extra research. And when you see things that are seemingly contradictions, dig into it, look at it, and 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 you know do word searches, do whatever you can do. Like I was searching for Meribah, I'm, you know, I'm finding all the places where it talks about it. And then in, I found, you know, Numbers 33, it's like, oh, perfect. This lay, lies out, lays out exactly everywhere that they went. And you can use these seemingly boring chapters and see, oh, the light goes on. That's, this is one of the reasons why this is even in here. This is one of the reasons why this chapter is here. This is here to help us learn, and, and there's so many more truths you can learn, and so many more things you could prove, and so many more things that don't have to be a mystery because of chapters like Numbers 33. That can, and that's why, you know, there's genealogies, there's other questions that come up, and you know what, these questions won't even come up normally until you start doing more in-depth studies of the Bible, and really start digging into it, and you start looking at this stuff and say, well, wait, 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 this doesn't make sense. And you can prove so much knowing the histories, knowing the genealogies, knowing when you start learning more about the characters in the Bible, and who they really were, and whether they're righteous men, whether they're evil men, and you start looking at that, and you see that, and you can see the, the genealogies in the line, you learn so many amazing truths, and so much insight into, the, into these events that happen in the Bible that, on the surface, yeah, you know the stories, but you start learning more of the details, and man, your, your, your wisdom just increases tremendously, and it's, and it's an amazing thing when you really dig into the Bible. But um, like I was saying, you know, it would have been really easy for me just to say, hey, these are two different events. You can just figure it out for yourself if you don't believe me, right? But it's important to go through this stuff and to see, oh, this is how you do it. You can, you can use this section, this section. Now, part of doing that is going to require you to have done a lot of reading to even kind of know where to go to look for different things. That's going to be part of it. Other things you could do is you could use tools. You could use concordances, or like I use eSword. It's, it's, a, it's a really great tool to do some word searches and find exact words within the, within the Bible. Um, but ultimately, in order to have to get the full uh, comprehension, the full understanding, you're going to have to have read the Bible multiple times just to just to have a good grasp on the things that the events that are taking place and what's happening. But um, I'd much rather show you how, how to come to these conclusions and kind of prove it to you myself than just saying that this is true or this is so. 
And this should also help you um, how to study the Bible for yourself. And, you know, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. We, you know, God expects us to prove the things that we believe and to, and to prove them and to know them and make it your belief. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I heard a sermon about this. And it was great and I learned from it and, and I was hearing it. But when you see something like this, it could shake what you believe maybe and then start to question it as it should. If you see something different in the Bible than what you've heard, even though it sounded good at the time, it sounded right, but then you see something in the Bible that might contradict that, that was the first thing I did is I questioned, well, wait, maybe what I heard wasn't right because I see this. Now, it turns out what I heard was right. It was accurate. It was correct. But I don't remember, I don't think he had, he had brought up anything about this reference in Exodus 17 to kind of show that, which threw me off. But then I was like, oh, okay, well, that was, I did verify it. But that's what we have to do. You know, you might hear some preaching. You might hear me preach on a subject, and I could be going through it, and it makes sense, and you're following, and you're saying, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, I get that. But then later on, maybe in your Bible reading, you see something else and go, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Pastor Burson's preached this, but, but that doesn't match up with what the Bible says here. And that's what you ought to be doing. I mean, hopefully you don't, hopefully you don't find that type of stuff. But, but if you do, I mean, search it out for yourself and be diligent and say, okay, well, Pastor Rosens is a man. You know, he, he could be wrong on something. But decide what the Bible says. And, and do enough study and say, okay, well, now I'm really going to search out and try to find everything that has to do with this for myself. And then that makes it your belief. Right? Like now I am much more founded in that this belief, yes, I've heard something similar that I'm preaching on tonight, preached on before in the preaching class, but it is, I mean, it's a smaller sermon. It's a lot shorter because it's a preaching class. So it's one smaller point. But now after doing a lot of this research on my own, hey, I can say like, this is my belief. It's not just something that I've heard or agreed with that I've heard preached. This is my own belief. I've studied this out on my own and I know exactly what I believe because I've found it. I've learned it. God has kind of taught it to me personally by going through the, the Bible and studying these things out for myself. And hopefully you can kind of learn how to do that on your own because it's important. I mean, obviously if you haven't read the Bible cover to cover, if you have only done it like once or twice, hey, before you really start digging into studies, just get through the Bible a few times. Get through it. Know, know, start to know the story. Start to know the characters a little bit and then start digging in and you can get a lot more truth and, and get so much knowledge out of the Bible. Now, I'm also going to get into tonight, now we're going to shift gears a little bit, into the symbolism and the New Testament applications with this story. Because God got really angry with Moses and Aaron. I mean, think about how great of a man Moses was and all of the righteous things that he did. He was chosen. He led the children of Israel out. He performed all these great miracles under the power of God. And God used him. He was a meek. He was a humble man. A great man of God referred to all throughout the Bible. One of the greatest men to ever walk this earth. One of, you know, other than obviously Jesus Christ and there's a few others that are really great men. Okay, John the Baptist. But um, one of the top Christians probably of all time we see here. Yet because of this event at the water of Meribah, God says, you're not, you're not going to see the problem. You're not going to go into the, the promised land. I mean, he's leading the children of Israel out. He intercedes for them. He offers, he said, look, God, don't kill them. I mean, he does all these great things. And he's chosen. He's a great leader. But because of this one event that was here, this is, this is a significant event in Moses' life, God says, no. You and Aaron, you are not going to cross that river and go to the promised land because of what happens here. And we're going to dig into this and see why is that such a big deal? Why does that matter so much? And we get a lot more insight into the symbolism and into the, the, um, the teaching of this specific event. Because you remember, a lot of things that happen in the Old Testament are symbolic. For example, I mean, you know, we brought this up many times, the Passover lamb, right? It's an extremely significant event back then because it symbolizes Jesus Christ coming and dying for our sins and shedding his blood on the cross. That needs to happen and be spelled out perfectly in the Bible because it's referring to and it's pointing to future events and it's referring to this extremely important event of Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins. And we're going to see why this, this event of speaking under the rock and the water coming out, why is that such a big event? Keep your finger in Numbers chapter 20 because we are going to come back there, but we're going to do a little bit of time in the, in the New Testament now. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 
just kind of keep a bookmark or something in, in Numbers chapter 20 because we're going to see then, I'm going to wrap it all up at the end and kind of bring and point out these, these problems of why this was so important. But in 1 Corinthians 10, we're going to see this application. Verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. This is going to be the, this is the first reference that we're turning to that we're going to see you know, basically that water coming out of the rock is symbolic of Jesus Christ being the rock and giving living waters from him. Okay, that is the major point, the major symbolism of that story that happened. And this is the first evidence of, well, the first evidence that we're turning to of that in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, talking about the people drinking of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. I mean, it spells it out saying that rock was Christ. You know, the rock that followed them, the, the spiritual waters. Turn, if you would, to John. We're going to look at a few verses in John. John chapter 7. It's going to be probably a little bit shorter sermon tonight. But John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 37. And then we're going to flip over to John chapter 4. But John chapter 7, verse 37, the Bible says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So here we have Jesus Christ himself saying, Look, anybody that thirsts, come to me. Any man that's thirsty, come unto me and I'm going to give him drink. And he says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You put your faith on Christ, out of your belly you're going to have rivers of living water coming out. And this is, he's referring to the Holy Ghost. When you put your faith on Christ, like we do today, any believer put their faith on Christ, you receive the Holy Ghost inside of you. You receive those living waters inside of you. And, and it's an amazing thing. And of course, remember, Jesus Christ is rock. Flip back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Again, we see another reference where Jesus Christ is speaking to the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, look at verse number 7. It says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then sent the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So here, three different references in the New Testament, you know, Jesus Christ speaking in two of them, talking about this living water, the water that brings forth everlasting life. That's gonna that you get just by believing, just by having faith, just by asking, right? He said he said to the woman, he says, um, "If thou knewest the gift of God," verse ten, and who does that say to thee, "Give me to drink"? Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He's saying, "Look, all you have to do is ask. I have living water. I have water that will." spring up in the everlasting life. All you have to do is ask. Now, this is why God was so angry with Moses and Aaron in Numbers chapter 20. Flip back there, if you would, to Numbers chapter 20. Because God commanded Moses to speak unto the rock. 
Remember that. He said in Numbers chapter 20, verse number 8, he says, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. This is exactly what Jesus Christ was saying to the woman at the well, where he says, if you would just ask me, if you just open up your mouth, speak, and ask me for that living water, I'll give it to you. This is the symbolic reference that's happening in Numbers chapter 20. It's a reference of salvation. It's a reference that God wanted to use he brought them through. There's a place of no water. They can't get water for themselves. They're in need. They're in dire need. In order to be saved, they need to drink. And they need water from somewhere. God says, look, I want you to speak unto this rock, and I'll give you that water that'll save your life. This is the event that happened. And because Moses took matters into his own hand and did not follow God's word exactly, but rather smote it with his own hands and hid it and did his own work, to get that water to come out, God says, no, now you're not going into the promised land. And he, and he, and he says, the reason why they don't get to do that, and uh, before I get to that, he said in verse 10, it says, Moses also said, must we fetch you out water from out of this rock? He said, must we get this water out of you out of this rock? And he hits the water, and he hits the rock. As if it's through his works and his effort. When God said, no, speak unto the rock. And it'll bring forth that water abundantly the same way that with Jesus Christ and the woman at the well. Hey, if you just ask me, I'll give you that living water. This is why God was so angry. And that's why he says, look at verse number 12 of Numbers 20. He says, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So he's saying he, his, his efforts of, of hitting the rock and bringing forth the water, God equates that to him not believing them. And which totally makes sense with this entire application, this entire symbolic reference, because obviously all we need to do to be saved is to believe. We just need to put our faith on him. We just need to believe God and trust him in his promises. He says, look, you didn't believe me. And the result of your lack of faith is not going into the promised land, right? <laughs> Physically, that was the real. Obviously, Moses was saved. We know that. He already he had his faith in God. He believed him, and he had eternal life. But physically speaking, he did not cross that Jordan River and go into the Israel's inheritance that, was, that God was giving to them physically. But that is the symbolic reference of, hey, if you don't believe God, you know, you won't get your eternal inheritance, your heavenly place, the promised land in heaven, you do not get that if you don't put your faith in God, if you don't put your faith in Christ. God will make sure you do not make it into that promised land. You will not inherit that land the same way that Moses was kept out of the promised land for his lack of faith and for taking matters into his own hands and smiting that rock. And this is, it, it was, it's a big deal I, th I believe in God's eyes because he uses these events for symbolic reference. He uses them and saying, no, that's not what I wanted to do. You're screwing up my plan. I told you to do it this way. I told you to speak under the rock and you didn't do it. And this, you know, all of God's commandments are important. So I don't want to make light of any of them. When we break one of God's commandments, when he tells us to do something, we don't do it. Hey, we don't know how much we're actually screwing up. We don't know what we're messing with. I mean, here, I'm sure Moses didn't consider or think that, like, you know, this is a, 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 an important message about salvation and everything else. I mean, if that thought would have crossed his mind, he, he, I'm sure he would have just followed and done what God had for him to do. He made a dumb choice or a dumb decision for whatever, whatever the reason. I mean, all sin and all disobedience to God is stupid. It's just, I mean, whatever the reason is, it's a dumb reason to disobey God. We don't have a justified reason for saying, well, no, I, God, I didn't listen to you because whatever stupid thought came across my head, you know, because I made a mistake. Moses made a mistake here, but it was a, it was a big deal because God had a plan and he, and he was using this event and using it to, to show a greater truth and to teach a great teaching here. And, and that teaching got messed up. Now, obviously, God's able to still make it work. I mean, we can still learn from this and we can still use this and we can see what he was doing with it. But 
it didn't work out the way that, that he had intended for it to work out. Um, but we still get this great truth from the Bible. And um, I believe that is why that punishment was so severe. Because you think about everything that Moses went through and all that he endured. And everything, you know, with the, with the people murmuring against him and, and, and his, the sacrifices Moses made and, you know, leading him through the wilderness and doing so many righteous things. It's like, now he's cut short from that reward. But, that, and that just kind of magnifies how important that was and how important, I mean, salvation is huge, right? Any, any reference to it, any teaching on salvation, we, you know, it's got to be right 100%. It's got to be dead on. Um, so basically, what can we learn? I'm just going to be wrapping things up here. What can we learn from all of this? This story. Number one, I would, I would, what we can take away from this, I think, is to study your Bible and approve all things. You know, I spent a lot of time, probably the first half of the sermon, just, just going through and showing how, you know, like, it says this here and this here. We know 100% for sure now that you don't even have to say, well, this is this only makes sense if it's two different places, but you're still kind of like, that's one or no. It is laid out, concrete, this is exactly the way it is. And I believe you can do that with pretty much anything in the Bible. You just have to know the Bible well enough, and you have to be able to know where to look and, and, and be able to figure, you know, figure it all out that way. Sometimes we, our lack of understanding you know, is just the reason why we don't... Our lack of understanding, not knowing God's word well enough, is what causes us not to understand it sometimes. Just, just not knowing enough. Um, the, reading the Bible never gets old. I mean, I couldn't imagine reading the same exact book over and over and over and over and over, and over again, you know, every single year. Like if it was just some novel, right? I mean, whether it be Shakespeare, whatever it is, I don't care what book you say, like, that would get old. I'd be like, I know this story already. I don't want to read it anymore. Like, I'm done. But with God's word is so deep, and there's so many things to learn. And I, I look forward to, you know, because there's so many things. Again, the, some of the most boring books of the Bible, where you think, of, you know, they're going through the tabernacle and all the different, you know, details that God has laid out. And okay, it's gonna have golden touches, and you know, they weighed this much, and it's, you know, and all these, all the little details. I believe there's some great truths just hidden in there. That that the more you dig in and the more you say, you're like, wow, wow, it's amazing. I never realized this this imagery or this you know the symbolism that he's showing us here and in, in doing this. And, and I can't wait for God to open up that type of knowledge to me. It's exciting because I, I when I saw this, it was exciting. You remember, honey, I was I was just like. It's it's joyful to, to see this and, have, and and God just teach you something and show you like man this is great. Um, study your Bible. Even don't skip over the boring chapters. They're, they're going to come in useful. I promise they'll come in useful later. Don't just skip over and say oh, I don't want to read this. Do it anyways. Even if you don't, even you don't understand right now, just you know I'm going to read this because you're going to see some of those names again. They'll start clicking together. I mean we might be slow creatures to understand sometimes, but you just keep at it and keep reading and keep reading and, and you'll start to, to have recollection and say, oh yeah, and then the Holy Spirit will then start to teach you the more you learn the Bible know it. Number two, what else can we take away from this sermon? When God gives you a clear commandment, follow his instructions exactly. Okay, don't take matters into your own hands. Don't say, well, I've got a different way of doing this. I know the Bible says I need to do this. I know God said to speak under the rock, but you know what? I'm going to take my rod like I did before because that worked last time and I'm just going to hit it this time. God told him to hit the rock once before, and it worked. And he, but he did exactly what God told him to do. See, the second time, that's not what God told him. Let's do exactly, follow to a T. I mean, if God gives us details about something, if God, if God tells you anything at all, there's a good reason for it. It's because he wants you to listen to him. He wants you to do it. He doesn't want you. You know, there's some things he might not tell us about. Do those things your own way. You know? Whatever, whatever it is that you're going to, you know, whatever, whatever color jacket you want to buy, right? Whatever socks you want to put on in the morning, okay? He's not telling you exactly which socks to put on. Pick out whichever ones you want. That's fine. But when he tells you something, you see this, hey, let's listen to him. When the Bible says, hey, don't look on the wine when it's red, when it gives it its cover in the cup, when it moves itself aright. 
Where he says, don't look at alcohol. Don't look at this stuff. Don't do it. That's what the Bible says. It's just, just heed his commandments. Say, you know, I'm not going to do that. They say, well, I'm, I'm going to look at it. I'm not, I'm not going to drink any of it, but I'm going to look at it. The Bible says, don't, don't even look at it. Don't mess with it. Follow his commandments exactly. Moses didn't do it. He cut corners. He did something a little bit different. And we see the result. It was, it was pretty severe punishment for Moses. I mean, God had some compassion on him. He allowed him to visibly, you know, perform a miracle, to visibly see the land with his eyes without actually stepping foot and crossing into it. Though. I mean, he worked so hard for so many years of his life to get to that goal of bringing him into the promised land, and he fell short of it because of this one sin, because he did not follow exactly what God had for him to do. So let's let's try to beware of that. I mean, I know we're sinners, but just, just try as hard as you can to follow God's word to a T. And then third, the last thing important, and, and this is the, the main concept of the story anyways in general, is just understand that the Bible always taught the salvation by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. All the way back to the water of Maribel. This is what he was getting at. It's always been through faith. It's always been through believing. We see Moses didn't get in the promised land because he didn't believe God. That was his punishment. It's always been by faith. And, and getting saved is as easy as taking a drink of water. I mean, that's what Jesus said to the woman at the well. He said, look, if you just ask me, just ask, I'll give you living water. You will never thirst again. What a great promise. Never again. All you have to do is just ask me. Just believe. Just put your faith on me. Believe. Ask me for that drink of water. It's easy to take a drink and just say, here's some water. Wow. That required zero effort. No work whatsoever. Taking a drink of water. That is how easy salvation is. Just put your faith in Christ. It has always been taught. God wanted these people. And he's trying. And I think that's one of the reasons. You know, they're going through this wilderness. But it's the same story over and over again because God's just trying to drive them. Look, rely on me. Stop complaining and start looking for other things. Just rely on me. They would, I mean, they could have, 40 years in the wilderness that they were in there, they didn't have to go through that if they would have just trusted God to begin with. But over and over again, that's why we see a lot of repetitive stories like this. Where they're saying, you know, God's bringing them into, it wasn't just one story where God brings them into a place where they didn't have water or they didn't have food. Right? But God's trying to ingrain it in their head. Look, believe me. Trust in me and just hope in me and say, hey, look, I'll take care of you. I've done it in the past. I mean, how many times did God have to bring these people food and water? And, and they complained every single time they ended up going without, it seems. Like every single time they get to a place, they're journeying, they're following God. I mean, they've got the, the tabernacle and the wilderness and, they're, and the pillar of cloud of smoke is there or the fire by night. And they're following, and they're picking up and moving, and they're following God, and they're following God. Why in the world would you not just think, okay, well, if God's leading us here, maybe we've gone without some water for a couple days. There's no water here. We're getting really thirsty, but God's going to take care of us. Instead of murmuring, complaining, and wanting to go back into sin, and going back into Egypt, and going back to the house of bondage. Last verse... Revelation 22, 17 sums it all up as far as, the, as far as the water of life and how easy it is to be saved. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Whosoever will. Anybody that wants to. It's the same, the same message that Christ gave. If you just ask. This is what we see at the water of Meribah. This is what we see. We say, look, speak unto the rock. Speak unto Jesus Christ. Ask him for that living water. He'll give it to you. Seriously. All you got to do is ask. Spar our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this great story. God, I thank you for teaching me this, this great uh, truth and... and um, Lord, for, for teaching me as I try to understand and study the Bible, dear Lord. and uh, You've already proven to me long ago that there are no, no contradictions in your word. But um, I thank you for, for helping me to understand these things as, as I, I find things that, that are troubling that I don't quite understand. 
Lord, I pray that you would please just help to open up my understanding on, on much more things in your word. And as well as everyone else that's here tonight, dear God, I pray that you please just help us all to, to know what you want more from us and just enlighten us, give us more, more understanding from your word. And um, we thank you for these great pictures of salvation and how easy it is, dear Lord, and for all the hard work that you've done for us, that you, you are so willing to just quench our thirst, quench that thirst for everlasting life, and just to give us that, that, that free gift. And give us that refreshment and give us that inheritance, dear Lord, that you promised unto us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.